one. Blast off. So good morning, everyone from Dreammaker Racing, Alan Studer and Pete Fornatel. We're going to do a little uh, derby and Oaks handicapping this morning. Uh, we've got about 25 minutes. We're very fortunate to have these two gentlemen with us. They took time from their very busy schedule, especially being Derby Week or the new Derby Week. And we're going to get down and do um, the uh, Derby and the Oaks. Pete Fornatel, an accomplished author, host of In the Money Players Pod podcast, writer for RacingPicks.com, and Alan Studer, who does host of the Stu podcast, the Stu podcast, which have been very kind to us as far as uh, sponsorships and having me on, and I'll be on again, so don't miss that. And uh, we'll get started. And this is hosted, of course, by Dream Maker Racing where we make your racing dreams come true. You guys take it away. Hey, thank you very much, Tom. This is a great platform uh, to, you know, be talking with fellow owners and, and a good friend in PTF. Uh, PTF, let's get right down to it because, you know, it's Derby Week and, and we've got 50,000 things going. For you, let's start off at the Oaks. Is it as simple as... Gamine or Swiss Skydiver? Or do you think that there is just pace-wise a different setup that we can kind of expect? Uh, is there too much speed? Is there not enough? What's your take? I really like speech in this spot. And a lot of it comes down to basic form line handicapping and also um, race design are the two reasons why I think speech has a big shot. Now, We'll see, there's a lot, there's gonna be a lot that happens in the first 100 yards of this race that's determinative potentially about what goes on. Is Swiss Skydiver's hand forced from down there to try to be aggressive and go right to the lead or is she gonna to try to flop outside of Gamine? Honestly, in either scenario, I think it's gonna make it very tricky for Swiss Skydiver. And for speech, to me, the case largely goes back to the form of that allowance race, the farthest that Gamine has run to this point, and the only horse that's ever tested her is Speech. I think Speech has come on since then. I think the extra distance plays into her hands as well, especially if Swiss Skydiver goes. I mean, I think Gamine will probably be good enough to, to take her on the turn, but I think she might be left wanting late. And, and I, think, I think she'll get the nine, but I don't know that she really wants the nine. I think Speech is really interesting. You can lock in prices in the UK right now about six to one. I don't think she'll be that on the tote, but I think she's an interesting alternative to the big two. And I'll certainly, in case Gamine is just a total free, have a one-way cover bet Gamine over speech in the Oaks. Uh, and I'll probably have a much smaller Swiss skydiver over speech in the Oaks. You know, the, the Oaks is really great too, because it, it seems to offer prices at a more uh, a reasonable rate uh, you know, than the Derby does sometimes, uh, especially winning up front. Is there a horse, uh, I know Matt Bernier's high on She Dares the Devil. Um, is there a horse that you like that at a price that, that you think can make that number that you might hook up with an exacto or key in a try? To be honest, I was not thrilled with the rest of the field. I really thought the ones at the top of the market were a cut above. Now, I'm not if I were more of a vertical exotics player, I would have a better answer to that question. But typically for me, I'm a horizontal player. And I mentioned the exacta because I like to use the exacta instead of a place bet. But I'm not usually one delving down into the deeper rungs of the exotics. I mean, if you wanted to just spitball in here, Dallas Stewart and the way he gets horses to finish in these big races, if you were looking for somebody to maybe pass a gas gamine or Swiss skydiver for third, I suppose you could go that way. But it also wouldn't surprise me one bit if this race ends up being the top three in those top three positions. I think they might have th that much in hand over the rest of this field. All right, and uh, Tom, you know, I, I think this would be a great time to ask you a question, actually. Uh, the winner of the Oaks as a broodmare prospect, the winner of the Derby, which me, uh, we'll get to in a moment, Pete, uh, what, what does this do for creating stallions or broodmares? How much value does this really add? Uh, a filly winning the Oaks? Yes. 
it, it adds uh, probably $2 million to their value. Easily. <laughs> At is the it, auction. <laughs> is it, is it are, worth more than, than maybe a Breeders' Cup race? Um, I think so. I think the Alabama, you know, for three-year-old fillies, the Alabama and the Oaks, uh, the Oaks probably – equal or a little bit more so than the Alabama as far as status and value to the pedigree, you know, the pedigree itself and to the Phillies themselves. Those are the two key, I think, key, um, uh, key races for value. And I think they rise above the Breeders' Cup. You know, these are the two traditional three-year-old Philly championship races. Yes, of course, now in modern times, we have the Breeders' Cup that essentially crown your champions but i think if a long shot if if a philly wins the alabama she wins the oaks and a long shot wins the breeders cup i think you're still going to give the championship to the winner of the alabama and the oaks beautiful and i'd like to point out before we leave the oaks that plink freud's uh full sisters from the family of speech so um, yes oh that would be huge yeah that would be uh i hope you're right ptf uh <laughs> All right, let's get to the Derby. We've got a few questions from uh, some of the folks joining in. And uh, thank you to everybody who, who did send in questions. Let, let's start off with, with uh, Tis the Law. Pete, uh, post-17, I've heard some people say, oh, gosh, now we've got a race. And I've heard some other folks, uh, I, I believe Sean Borman the other day said he loves it on your show, the Tuesday uh, racingpicks.com show. Uh, where do you stand on post 17 for Tis the Law? I think it's an unmitigated positive, unless the track is playing in a way that I'm not expecting it to. One of the questions about Tis the Law is his ability to run inside of horses. When he had the, the subpar race at Churchill, there were a lot of things that were uh, you know, different that day. One was obviously being at Churchill. The other was the mud. But then there's also the fact that he was down inside and didn't look comfortable. And Manny spent the whole race trying to get him out of there. And I would have had questions if he drew, you know, six or in, I think, based on that idea. To be drawn outside for him, I think it's perfect. He just, all he needs to do is avoid getting fired at the start. And I, and I think the race is going to be in uh, well within hand. I think he's going to get Hopefully he just lets Authentic go. Authentic gives him that toe into the race, blows that one up on the turn coming for home, and, and draws off to win by three. I really think, unless he stubs his toe or something unexpected happens, I think this derby is as simple as tis the law. The more I look and the more I play this race in my head, the more I like him. I think I'm up in my head to agreeing with Sean that he is like a 70, 75% to win this race which means we just got to, I mean, for me, I don't mind betting a shorter price on the win end. That is within my personality. I will, I will allow for that. So I think there, I don't know what's going to happen. There's a chance everybody in the world is just going to pummel the horse and, and he'll be one to two and, and there won't be enough juice in the odds to, to necessarily bother. But I could also see the effect we've seen in other years of people betting narratives names and numbers the three ends that you see in the whips for the kentucky derby and he actually might be four to five just because for the math to work out he might be four to five and if that's the case i might just keep things very simple um i do like a long shot for underneath that, w that we can talk about but uh on the win end if i were to get four to five on tis the lie that would be as good value as anything else we're going to see he's trading currently international markets at around four to six so lower than that but again i think there's reasons why on the tote he could be longer than with bookmakers just based on for lack of a better word mug money what is that horse? that horse wouldn't happen to be named attachment rate it? <laughs> i do like attachment rate i think 50 to one on the morning line is a bit wild i think this is a, a this horse is sort of a trip handicapper's dream and a lot of figure makers, including the likes of Sean Borman and Paul Matisse, have the figures between um, the Ellis Park race and the Travers a lot closer. So he does, I don't, don't get me wrong. I think it will be unlikely that he beats Tis the Law, but I think he could beat everybody else. And I feel like, um, you know, fortunately, this is another one of these cases where I will get drawn into the vertical pools just to express my opinion that he could hit, that he could hit the board. I might have some sort of, 
and I'll, I'll weight it. I, I don't just play alls and leave it at all. I'll, I'll press horses I like more than this, but there'll be some version of tis all attachment, tis all, all attachment, as well as a big straight tis attachment. And then of course, well, I've already bet through an associate in the UK, I'm on it 40 to one each way. So I, right now I've got 40 to one on him to win and I'll get eight to one should he hit in the top three. So I've got a little bit of action already, but if he's going to really be these kind of prices, I'm going to need to get more involved. Certainly wouldn't be one of the top 10 pro punters in the UK today. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, that's interesting. A lot of people, I know I was talking to uh, Andrew Calvano who's on this call and, and we like the attachment rate too. And you mentioned some of the betting aspect. We have a, a, a question here. And it pertains to this, this uh, management style of how we're going to uh, bet this race. And the question is, is it worth it to key a horse on top of a trifecta with all and all? Is it even worth it? Or do you find that it's better management money-wise to try and cut that in half or buy a third or by a fourth or what have you and, and do a box type thing. Um, it, you know, this is much more of a ticket construction kind of question, but what is your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I don't think you have to choose between an all and doing something more efficient. I think you can do both. And boxing is just something that makes my teeth itch. Um, you know, some sort of weighted box, maybe. So by weighted, what I mean is, um, and, and this is back to the idea of the all all. There might be a min, especially in the super with its 10 cents, there might be a minimum ticket that gets played all all. So 10 cents of all all. But then I'm going to go back through and I'm going to look for horses that I like to potentially run in the number at big prices and have instead of a 10 cent, maybe have a $10 combination landing on if you get, you know. Uh, well, I'll use Sean's wise guy long shot for underneath South Bend, you know, a ticket that has a much larger iteration with South Bend running third and fourth with attachment rate third and fourth with some sort of modified all in that second spot. Because I also, as I look at this field, there's not a lot of horses either that I like for second. So I might have plenty of, um, you know, one, one by four, buy and then again maybe a 10 cent all but then i'm, I'm definitely going to look to go back and uh and play the horses that that i think can really are very likely to run in that number a thousand words to me you know his odds of running third you know very big long shot to win odds of running third or fourth pretty strong so i don't you know i don't want to just have a 10 center with him but it's a chaotic enough race for third and fourth that I do like the idea of having that coverage. And, you know, if you can't, if, if the budget makes it too much to do, I would say what you want to do in that situation is just cut, cut down. I mean, you just, you just have to start splitting hairs and splitting potentially atoms and trying to figure out which of these runners you want in. The most important thing is that you participate in pools that you can express your opinion properly at your budget. And if you can't, pick another pool. You know, there's no, one of the good things about betting on the toad is we have so many options. So you don't want to find yourself in that position of trying to put a, a square peg into a round hole. It just doesn't work out. So if the supers are getting too expensive, focus your time on the exacta. You know, the, 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 the more legs of a, a wager you add, the more, the greater the degree of difficulty and the bigger bankroll you need to bet it efficiently. The best overarching line about this topic comes from Mike Maloney and his book, Betting with an Edge. Still have a handful of copies of that around if anybody's <laughs> interested, where he talks about how the bet that you write should be expressing your opinion as properly as possible. And that's the thing with a box. Like your opinion is never, oh, it's these three horses in the exact and I like them all equally. I mean, maybe it is in a rare instance, but much more often you like one horse more than the other and, and you should key as opposed to look to key the horse you really like with some other possibilities as opposed to boxing, which is almost necessarily inefficient and one of the reasons I don't like it. So hopefully that helps answer that question. 
Well, no, I think that's a great explanation, detailed. Uh, at last question, as we wind it down here, and thank you again for the time, PTF. Uh, it, you talk a lot on in the Money Players podcast, uh, and it comes up uh, routinely about designing a race in your head. Um, for the Derby, there, there's 800 horses in the starting gate, it feels like. How do you design a race like this in your head, and, and where do you want to see your horse in the pack? I feel like authentic is going to be a pretty clear speed in this spot. So I start my race design pretty much with who I think is going to be the leader. And I think he'll go on with it. You know, I did conjure that frightening scenario of him drifting over at the start and potentially, um, you know, messing with tis the law, because obviously he's going to want to, he's going to want to get out and get over as fast as possible. I, I'd like to think Manny's going to be aware of that and hopefully, can and can just let, let him do his thing. I, I don't see him quarter horsing Tiz out of the gate. I see Tiz just breaking, authentic crossing over, and then I see Tiz assuming a nice stalking position. I think other horses will try to make the lead, uh, or but I don't think they'll be fast enough to. And there is a possibility of Tiz being very wide as a result going into the first turn. I guess that's what people are saying. Oh, we've got a race now about. But he's just proven himself so capable of getting that trip, even three wide, three wide. We've seen him do it enough times now that I'm not really worried about that taking the starch out of his form. And then from there, you know, I see the key I, – I feel like the key matchup, the key thing that's going to happen, the question that's going to be asked during the race is when Tis the Law goes and tries to take authentic. And if I'm right, like the rest of it, a really good race designer, somebody truly expert and somebody who's more of a vertical player will have all these scenarios for exactly what's going to happen in behind. I didn't really take it that far. I kind of see it as that's the, the, the key moment of the race is when Tis the Law goes to authentic. And if Tis the Law doesn't break or, or problems ensue, you know, my opinion's kind of out the window. And, and then from there, I'll just hope to get lucky. But I've really only designed the race as far as, as what I see those two key contenders doing. And I think in this instance, that might be enough. You know, I did say that this, that was the last question, but I'm going to pull a Willy Wonka <laughs> here and strike that and reverse it. Uh, my absolute last question, and, and this is for you, PTF, and you, Tom. Quick, quick hitter, favorite derby winner. The, it's um, a, yeah, go you go first, Tom. I've been talking about it. Mind that bird. I love it. I love it. Any particular reason, Tom? Just, I, I can't watch that race enough. Um, also, my wife picked him and she won on him. But, but at the same time, <laughs> it, it's like everybody else is standing still and he even, caught, he even caught Tom Durkin by surprise. The horse moved like everybody else was standing still. Too. I'm getting goosebumps right now, just, just imagining the race in my mind. No, and, and he was an underdog and, and I loved it. And I love when they came to the trainer and kept talking about his pickup truck. And he said to the pickup truck, I want, I just won the damn derby. Stop talking about my pickup truck. I just love the whole, the whole program. The whole scenario was fabulous. And plus my, my, my lovely wife was jumping through the, uh, the jumping to the rafters because she had it. So it was fabulous. It's fantastic. PTF. Got to go with Silver Charm, 1997 Kentucky Derby. The first one I, like, properly studied all the form, knew all the horses. Um, that was the kind of thing that whatever I, whatever I won on him is irrelevant because it was this incredible life-changing score that really put me on the path of becoming a serious horse player and, and changing horse racing eventually from uh, avocation to vocation. And I, I wish I could send you the, I don't have time to send you the shot, but I, I got to meet him last year out at Old Friends, thanks to uh, Michael Blowen. And, and it was one of the great pleasures of my life, like meeting, meeting a childhood hero for me in adulthood, getting to see the great Silver Charm, happy in himself, living out there in uh, Georgetown, Kentucky. He's, he's the horse that did it to me, and, and his derby will always be the one I remember the best. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Please check out In the Money Players podcast this week. You are, I think you've got 500 podcasts you got to do, 300 videos. It's, it's going to be nuts, PTF. 
what can people kind of expect as they're tuning in this week? I think one that I'm really looking forward to is one we, we talked about before uh, when, when I'm going to be hopefully sitting down with the Matisse brothers and Sean Borman to talk all about betting strategy. That's going to be fun. We've got some cool promotional offers you'll hear about on the various shows. We've got uh, the Let Loose uh, Answering Derby Questions edition with me and JK. That'll be video and audio. And then we've got another RacingPicks.com show today where we're not only going to go over derby races, but we're going to be going over races happening at other tracks because even though there's no fans, still like 17 hours between races and we horse players aren't going to just sit on our hands. We need other races to bet. So if you want to hear some analysis of what's going on at Naira and Woodbine, you can check out that RacingPicks.com player show. One other thing I'll put in a quick plug for, we talked about the Oaks, but I did a, a little bit of analysis on all the Oaks undercard over on RacingPicks.com, a little written piece, and it's free. You just have to give them your email, sign up for their expert picks, and you'll get a lot of stuff from me and Matt Bernier, Andrew Champagne, and the team over there. I'm excited to be working with those cats, and I would imagine everybody watching this call would appreciate uh, reading my analysis there as well as some of the other handicappers and horse players. So check it all out. And the best way to just, you know, if you're interested in my act, at Looms Boldly on Twitter and in the moneypodcast.com. You, you are a pitch man from a bygone era. That's why I, uh, I appreciate you, Pete. All right. Thank you to Tom. Thank you to Dreammaker Racing. This has been an excellent, uh, you know, half an hour. Good luck. May you cash all your tickets. I came up with that. I didn't steal it. Um, and thank you, everybody. And, and we'll see you next time uh, for the Preakness. We'll run this back for the Preakness. How's that sound, Tom? Yeah, that would be great. Yes. And, and – a la Harvey Pack, may the horse be with you, right? Right. Pete? Yeah, that's a perfect way to end it. There's uh, the legend, my, my great <laughs> friend and mentor. You got to give him the last word. Good stuff. All right, thank you.